Capo from Preston County. Dave uh, is a professional land surveyor, independent mapping and cartography consultant. He has an AS in land surveying and regents, Bachelor of Arts, Glenville State College. He was elected to the State Senate in 2006. He has a wide range of uh, interests and affiliations. Some examples are uh, the Junior ROTC Rifle Team and the WVU Rifle Club, supporter of uh, FFA and 4-H programs. He's a licensed cam radio operator, member and former director of the West Virginia Society of Professional Surveyors, a member of the American Congress in Surveying and Mapping, National Society of Professional Surveyors, Preston County Farm Bureau, and many other things, as well as a member of the WBATP. Let's welcome Dave Sockwell. Thank you, Rob. Dave Seipel, that's the way it appears on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> so how many in here are from West Virginia? Just a quick hand. Oh, it's better than half, it looks like. Uh, everyone who's from West Virginia vote on Tuesday or maybe vote early? Yes. Yeah? Oh, absolutely. How many voted for Keith Judd? The, uh, never mind, I don't want to know. <laughs> I really don't want to know. <laughs> how many people know who your legislators are? Everyone should have at least one delegate and two senators. You know, how many have ever spoken to, written a letter, or had a meeting with your legislator? Just let them know who you are. Fantastic. That's a better response than I usually get. I'm in my sixth year, in the middle of my second term right now. I'm a representative of the 14th Senatorial District, which is a portion of Montegay County. Actually, I'm just outside of my district here, so I think I'll have to keep my comments brief, right? I also have Taylor, Barber, Tucker, Preston, part of Grant, part of Mineral, and all of Hardy County now with the new redistricting. But um, the, um, by far, in all seriousness, um, being a representative of the people of the state of West Virginia has been uh, the greatest honor and responsibility that's ever been bestowed upon me. Um, some of the responsibilities I have in the legislature, of course, were broken up into committees, is I serve on finance and government organization, energy industry and mining, agriculture, interstate cooperation, confirmations, in technology. So you can see with 34 senators, we all have a very wide range of responsibilities. You can't just specialize in one area. With the June 28, 2010 passing of U.S. Senator Robert C. Byrd, a fundamental change occurred in the West Virginia Senate's leadership. Now that change is both geographical and philosophical. Geographically, the leadership in the Senate with Tomlin and Chafin was located in Logan County and Mingott County. Now it has shifted northward. With Kessler and Unger, we have the leadership coming from Marshall County, in the northern Panhandle, and Berkeley County, in the eastern Panhandle. Um, philosophically, the makeup of the leadership has changed largely from a business backed body to a labor backed body, and we've seen policies coming out which reflect that. Despite the uncertainties, the legislative process did continue. In the past two years, we've held two special elections, passed the Horizontal Drilling Act, Prescription Medication and Drug Use Abuse and Prevention Act, dealt with other post-employment benefits, a huge, a huge problem for our state, and passed a Cracker Tax Incentive to uh, help entice businesses into the state. The legislature is directed by the state constitution to pass an annual budget, and that budget must be balanced. Unlike our counterpart in Washington, D.C., who can't put their own money. When we get to the end of the budget, we're done. Uh, this year, the general revenue was predicted, or for next fiscal year, was predicted to be $4.15 billion, with an overall budget of $11.6 billion. That includes the federal subsidies and, and all different areas of the budget. Um, the budget this year, coming up, has an additional $125 million just for the Medicaid allotments. And that's just to keep the current level of service where we are right now. Now, unlike many other states, today and over the past few years, West Virginia did not have to furlough or lay off any public employees or teachers. Quite an accomplishment, saying that many states are in very serious trouble financially. Most sources of revenue are estimated to grow during the next six-year forecast period. However, the lottery revenues are projected to decline. They're going to decrease. This affects our general budget, lottery budget, and excess lottery. The bad news is, 
from fiscal year 2014 through 2017, we're looking at a shortfall of about $390 million per year. Uh, and this is due mainly to the mandatory increase in the Medicaid spending. There's going to be a decrease in the federal matches. I see a head shaking over here. Some of them are very familiar. Right? There's going to be, we're going to be adding approximately 170,000 additional members to the rolls. And, of course, I mentioned before the decrease in lottery revenue, which helps pay and offset those, those costs. What's the solution? It's very simple. We're either going to increase our revenues, we're going to decrease our services, or we're going to do a combination of both. There's nowhere else to go. Being a relatively new and naive, I will use naive, legislator, I expected to enter the legislature and turn the world on its ear. It hasn't happened yet. I think I'm just right on the front. I'm right on that cusp. I'm ready to break over. <laughs> West Virginia has a citizen legislature, and everyone brings something new to the table. We have lawyers, insurance agents, ministers, real estate developers, bankers, farmers, bus drivers, teachers, physicians. You get the idea. Everyone has their area of expertise. West Virginia has a part-time legislature, unlike some other states. We have a regular session that runs from January through March. And then the rest of the year is called the interim session, where we meet for three days each month in preparation for the following session. In fact, our interim starts next Monday. So Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'll be in Charleston uh, for the interim sessions. And that's where we do study resolutions and we prepare legislation and work out problems that weren't able to get resolved during the last regular session. For any bill to be passed into law, it requires 70 people. At a minimum, 70 people. Can you imagine getting 70 people in any body to agree on any one thing? There has to be 18 senators, there has to be 51 House of Delegate members, and there has to be one governor. And any breakdown in that process would stop a bill in its tracks. In fact, it's much easier to stop legislation than it is to create and pass legislation. Many times we find ourselves playing defense. Just please don't let us pass anything bad this year. Sometimes I think maybe it'd be better to only have a legislative session every two years. You know, less damage can be done. Nonetheless, one of the tricks that, um, and I'm kind of new at this whole game, between the legislative and executive branch, there's always this little rift between them because, you know, one kind of does the work and the other kind of sets the rules. But uh, I think that many of the seasoned veterans in, in the agencies understand that if you stonewall the legislature for 60 days, the legislators go home, and then they forget why they were dogging the agency. So they can get by with a lot of stuff. And that's unfortunate. That's probably the only downside, or one of the downsides of having a part-time legislature. You're not there with a the constant effort the whole year long. So it seems like when uh, January 6th or 7th rolls around each year, it's like a whole new page. You're starting fresh. 2011 marked a special year for the West Virginia legislature. We went through the process of redistricting, or what is more accurately referred to as reapportioning the population into relatively equal districts. The use of GIS technology, of course, greatly simplified that process. And I think, I wasn't around the legislature 10 years ago, but I think they used some GIS technology at that time too, but maybe not to the same extent. The ability to quickly change and total up populations for many in, uh, scenarios, including demographic information, was invaluable. In fact, it put the power of redistricting and reapportionment into the hands of the legislature. In fact, on a personal basis, many times I think this past year was the first time, or at least the closest encounter that many legislators had ever had with you know, using GIS type technology and, and seeing its benefits. So it was a great learning experience. Um, GIS technology, of course, has been both an invisible force and an incredibly powerful tool, increasing as time goes on to provide information by which decisions can be rendered. Of course, the year before was the decennial census, which was taken in the U.S., and that would have been absolutely impossible, you know, without the use of GIS technology. The important role the GIS community plays in everyday life really absolutely cannot be overstated. And I'll speak from the position of the legislator. Unfortunately, convincing the legislators and convincing some agencies of those benefits is difficult. Because everything comes with a price tag. It's difficult to say, well, if you spend $100,000 here, you're going to save $200,000 down the road. Well, that's $100,000 today. Um, and it's not always about money. Sometimes it's about disbelief and, and 
not fully understanding benefits and uses. One size does not fit all. We've heard that a hundred times before. We have 55 different counties. We have 55 different needs and 55 different abilities. And I'll pull some counties. I don't know, you know, uh, intuitively which counties are in or out, but maybe the more populated counties like Kanawha, Wood, and Montegetia probably have their addressing and mapping completed. I know Preston County is completed. And then some of the more rural counties, maybe like Tucker and Grant, some areas, they might not even have started theirs yet or are just now in the, in the development stage. So we have, we have a state full of counties in different areas and trying to address all those needs at the same time are almost, almost impossible. And how about the county leaders who don't want to share information? I've seen that more than once. You know, they don't want to give any information to the, to the public. There's certainly something to be said for keeping information close to your best. Right? And as for GIS, I want it, but I don't want my colleague to have it because information is power. And knowledge is power. So sometimes the decision makers want to be in the privileged class. And those are some of the challenges that we have to overcome as a society to, to bring forth the good and, and allow people to understand that this is a win-win situation for everyone. And it's not about haves and have-nots. Um, right now, I'd like to ask the person at the podium to speak for a minute about land surveying. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dave Seipel, a professional land surveyor. Well, you're a tough crap, I saw. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dave Seipel. I'm a CAD user. expecting a rock name to come down this way. <laughs> Literally, I've been surveying since I was old enough to hold a rock. My father was surveying. And um, I've practiced full-time since 1986. I'm licensed in West Virginia and Pennsylvania and president of Surveyor Associates for 19 years now. In Preston County, we employ about 14. There's a chasm separating surveying professionals from GIS in West Virginia, of course, I use the word chasm, but West Virginia we call them hollows or hollers. And this distrust, I think, has been built on the ignorance of one another's practice. The same types of misunderstandings exist even in the profession of land surveying from two different practitioners that practice in different areas. If you ask a geodetic surveyor about a linden tree and pointers or pulling chain, you'll probably not understand what you're talking about. And if you talk to a boundary surveyor about GPS heights based on NABD 88 and GOID 97, they're probably going to give you blank look. You're not going to have a clue what you're talking about. But I'll tell you right now that I have the best job in the world, and I look forward to it almost every day of the week. They say, find a job doing what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. And that's true. I've had the opportunity to be about as close to a general practitioner for professional surveying as you can get. I go to the courthouse and do title searches. I plot deeds and put them together. Field survey. I look for, discover, and measure evidence. Make calculations and decisions. Draw maps. Write reports. Deal with lawyers, developers, clients, landowners, construction workers, equipment operators, engineers, geologists, and other surveyors. Sometimes I'm an expert witness. I prepare and go to court. I do environmental permitting, water sampling, pre-blast and pre-subsidence plans. Prepare reclamation plans. Design and drainage structures, haul roads, ponds, survey and mines, both surface and deep. Survey and landfills, do construction stakeout, pre engineering topographical surveys and maps, calculate volumes, cross sections, profiles, and draw those up. Do aerial photo control points and GPS control surveys. That's a pretty wide area to know a little bit about. Yet my experience will only scratch the surface of the full scope of what professional surveyors do. Prior to being elected to the West Virginia Legislature, I was a Preston County Surveyor. I worked with Assessor Terry Funk and Mapper Connie Urban to develop a cadastral GIS for the um, real estate assessment in the assessor's office. So I provided a little bit of guidance early on, but then I stepped back and watched it unfold. You know, it was a very useful product, one to be very proud of. I am concerned that many of the 55 counties are, quote, doing their own thing. There's a need perhaps I should say a great need, 
for a state level guidance to bring all these mapping products together and provide some level of interoperability. In and of themselves, they each stand alone, but try to cross the boundary, and you're probably asking for trouble. Part of the challenge for interoperability lies in the difficulty of easily moving data between a CAD environment and a GIS environment. You know, and anybody who has tried to do that understands those frustrations. And I was thinking about that this morning when I was getting ready to come down here. If you don't understand those types of frustrations, next time you brush your teeth, try to use your other hand. It's kind of like that. You can get the job done, but it's kind of awkward, and it feels unnatural. And it really is. It's a very unnatural process. And I don't understand why, but I just know it is. I'm not sure what the solution is to that. But um, established GIS data sets work within a defined real-world type coordinate system, which is you know, mathematically defined both horizontally and vertically. Now, surveyors, depending on their application, can be perfectly comfortable working off of assumed data. And I know when you speak to a GIS professional about that, that's a very foreign concept. You mean you don't know where you are? Well, yeah, I know where I am. I'm right here by the oak tree. But I don't know what latitude and longitude I'm at, necessarily. It might not be important. In a boundary surveying situation, it's very common to you know, assume a magnetic north. It's called dropping a needle. Here's more. I can also drive a nail in the ground and assign a set of coordinates to it, just arbitrarily. Say, that's 10,000, 10,000, we're going to go from there. And it works. It works very well. As long as everything is relative. It's all about relativity. Boundaries in West Virginia are legally controlled by the monuments defining their limits, not necessarily a geographic location. Is that monument on the ground, I don't care where geographically it's located with respect to Greenwich, England, is that monument on the ground, be it a stone, a tree, a pin, a pipe, that's what control for boundaries, and that's what we focus on. The most important task a surveyor can perform is, number one, to retrace the footsteps of the surveyor who went before him, and secondly, to leave monuments behind for the landowner, for the adjoiner, and for the future surveyor to find where he can walk. So it's all about the physical, where you've been. I can't really say what the most important task of being a GIS professional would be, but I'm pretty sure that properly registering a shape file you know, to a genetically defined coordinate system ranks up there pretty high. That's probably one of the more important things that, that you have to do. There are reasons why boundary surveys are not registered to a geodetic position in West Virginia specifically. One reason, one probably one of the most, most uh, real reasons is because the lack of density of control monuments in our state. It could be very difficult for me as a practitioner going and doing a simple boundary survey if there is such a thing as a simple boundary survey. You're registering into latitude and longitude position if the nearest control is two miles away, or three miles, or ten miles, or fifteen miles away. And smaller firms who probably do the bulk of the boundary survey work in our state are typically smaller firms. And they don't utilize GPS or survey grade GPS technology due to cost constraints and maybe training constraints, maybe personnel constraints. So it's not a simple matter to bring that control in. There have been a few steps going in the right direction to help correct this uh, this chasm, collar, if you will, between the GIS and, and surveying world. There have been several GIS presentations for surveyors, including a hands-on workshop just a couple months ago uh, by Kevin Kuhn at the Surveyors Convention. That helps the professionals in the surveying world understand a little bit about the GIS world. And I think that there would be some, some interest in, and possibly some benefit to conversely having some Survey 101 type training. And how does it work? Let's, let's go out and do a little bit of, you know, let's bring some points in. Let's, let's see what it takes to put a boundary together. What does the survey do? Maybe that would be beneficial to the GIS community also. 
In 2010, there was legislation defining the areas of practice for professional surveying, and there was an adoption of the NCWES model laws. That's, um, I'm not sure what it stands for, uh, engineering and surveying licensing uh, model laws, which address surveying with respect to GIS and GIS with respect to surveying, because there are obviously some overlap in practice. And one of the most obvious overlaps in practice is one of our products. Surveyor performs a survey, whether that's a boundary survey or a volume survey or a we produce a map. And the GIS professional has a data set and, and performs analysis and they produce a map also. So the products might look similar. And there's confusion in, well, maybe one is trying to take the place of the other. But there are actually two completely different processes and two completely different um, products. Well, thank you for your time and attention today, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have either now or later on.